Section 45 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 45. The Relief of Knoxville. Headquarters moved to Nashville. Visiting Knoxville. Cipher, cipher dispatches. Withholding orders. Chattanooga, now being secure to the national troops beyond any doubt, I immediately turned my attention to relieving Knoxville about the situation of which the President, in particular, was very anxious. Prior to the battles, I had made preparations for sending troops to the relief of Burnside at the very earliest moment after securing Chattanooga. We had there two little steamers which had been built and fitted up from the remains of old boats and put in condition to run. General Thomas was directed to have one of these boats loaded with rations and ammunition and move up the Tennessee River to the mouth of the Holston, keeping the boat all the time abreast of the troops. General Granger, with the 4th Corps, reinforced to make 20,000 men, was to start the moment Missionary Ridge was carried, and under no circumstances were the troops to return to their old camps. With the provisions carried, and the little that could be got in the country, it was supposed he could hold out until Longstreet was driven away, after which event East Tennessee would furnish abundance of food for Burnside's army and his own also. While following the enemy on the 26th, and again on the morning of the 27th, part of the time by the road to Ringgold, I directed Thomas, verbally, not to start Granger until he received further orders from me, advising him that I was going to the front to more fully see the situation. I was not sure but that Bragg's troops might be over their stampede by the time they reached Dalton. In that case, Bragg might think it well to take the road back to Cleveland, move thence towards Knoxville, and, uniting with Longstreet, make a sudden dash upon Burnside. When I arrived at Ringgold, however, on the 27th, I saw that the retreat was most earnest. The enemy had been throwing away guns, caissons, and small arms, abandoning provisions, and altogether seemed to me moving like a disorganized mob, with the exception of Claiborne's division, which was acting as rear guard to cover the retreat. When Hooker moved from Rossville toward Ringgold, Palmer's division took the road to Graysville, and Sherman moved by the way of Chickamauga Station toward the same point. As soon as I saw the situation at Ringgold, I sent a staff officer back to Chattanooga to advise Thomas of the condition of affairs and direct him by my orders to start Granger at once. Feeling now that the troops were already on the march for the relief of Burnside, I was in no hurry to get back, but stayed at Ringgold through the day to prepare for the return of our troops. Ringgold is in a valley in the mountains, situated between East Chickamauga Creek and Taylor's Ridge, and about twenty miles southeast from Chattanooga. I arrived just as the artillery that Hooker had left behind at Chattanooga Creek got up. His men were attacking Claiborne's division, which had taken a strong position in the adjacent hills, so as to cover the retreat of the Confederate army through a narrow gorge which presents itself at that point. Just beyond the gorge the valley is narrow and the creek so tortuous that it has to be crossed a great many times in the course of the first mile. This attack was unfortunate and cost us some men unnecessarily. Hooker captured, however, three pieces of artillery and 230 prisoners. 
and 130 rebel dead were left upon the field. I directed General Hooker to collect the flour and wheat in the neighboring mills for the use of the troops, and then to destroy the mills and all other property that could be of use to the enemy, but not to make any wanton destruction. At this point Sherman came up, having reached Graysville with his troops, where he found Palmer had preceded him. Palmer had picked up many prisoners and much abandoned property on the route. I went back in the evening to Graysville with Sherman, remained there overnight, and did not return to Chattanooga until the following night, the 29th. I then found that Thomas had not yet started Granger, thus having lost a full day which I deemed of so much importance in determining the fate of Knoxville. Thomas and Granger were aware that on the 23rd of the month Burnside had telegraphed that his supplies would last for 10 or 12 days, and during that time he could hold out against Longstreet. But if not relieved within the time indicated, he would be obliged to surrender or attempt to retreat. To effect a retreat would have been an impossibility. He was already very low in ammunition, and with an army pursuing, he would not have been able to gather supplies. Finding that Granger had not only not started, but was very reluctant to go, he, having decided for himself that it was a very bad move to make, I sent word to General Sherman of the situation and directed him to march to the relief of Knoxville. I also gave him the problem that we had to solve, that Burnside had now but four to six days' supplies left, and that he must be relieved within that time. Sherman, fortunately, had not started on his return from Graysville, having sent out detachments on the railroad which runs from Dalton to Cleveland and Knoxville to thoroughly destroy that road, and these troops had not yet returned to camp. I was very loath to send Sherman, because his men needed rest after their long march from Memphis and hard fighting at Chattanooga. But I had become satisfied that Burnside would not be rescued if his relief depended upon General Granger's movements. Sherman had left his camp on the north side of the Tennessee River, near Chattanooga, on the night of the 23rd the men having two days cooked rations in their haversacks. Expecting to be back in their tents by that time, and to be engaged in battle while out, they took with them neither overcoats nor blankets. The weather was already cold, and at night they must have suffered more or less. The two days' rations had already lasted them five days, and they were now to go through a country which had been run over so much by Confederate troops that there was but little probability of finding much food. They did, however, succeed in capturing some flour. They also found a good deal of bran in some of the mills, which the men made up into bread, and in this and other ways they eked out an existence until they could reach Knoxville. I was so very anxious that Burnside should get news of the steps being taken for his relief, and thus induce him to hold out a little longer if it became necessary, that I determined to send a message to him. I therefore sent a member of my staff, Colonel J. H. Wilson, to get into Knoxville if he could, report to Burnside the situation fully, and give him all the encouragement possible. Mr. Charles A. Dana was at Chattanooga during the battle, and had been there even before I assumed command. Mr. Dana volunteered to accompany Colonel Wilson, and did accompany him. I put the information of what was being done for the relief of Knoxville into writing, and directed that in some way or other it must be secretly managed so as to have a copy of this fall into the hands of General Longstreet. They made the trip safely. General Longstreet did learn of Sherman's coming in advance of his reaching there, 
and Burnside was prepared to hold out even for a longer time if it had been necessary. Burnside had stretched a boom across the Holston River to catch scows and flats as they floated down. On these, by previous arrangements with the loyal people of East Tennessee, were placed flour and corn, with forage and provisions generally, and were thus secured for the use of the Union troops. They also drove cattle into Knoxville by the east side, which was not covered by the enemy, so that when relief arrived, Burnside had more provisions on hand than when he had last reported. Our total loss, not including Burnside's, in all these engagements amounted to 757 killed, 4,529 wounded, and 330 missing. We captured 6,142 prisoners, about 50% more than the enemy reported for their total loss, 40 pieces of artillery, 69 artillery carriages and caissons, and over 7,000 stands of small arms. The enemy's loss in arms was probably much greater than here reported because we picked up a great many that were found abandoned. I had at Chattanooga in round numbers about 60,000 men. Bragg had about half this number, but his position was supposed to be impregnable. It was his own fault that he did not have more men present. He had sent Longstreet away with his corps swelled by reinforcements up to over twenty thousand men thus reducing his own force more than one-third and depriving himself of the presence of the ablest general of his command he did this too after our troops had opened a line of communication by way of brown's and kelly's ferries with bridgeport thus securing full rations and supplies of every kind, and also when he knew reinforcements were coming to me. Knoxville was of no earthly use to him while Chattanooga was in our hands. If he should capture Chattanooga, Knoxville, with its garrison, would have fallen into his hands without a struggle. I have never been able to see the wisdom of this move. Then, too, after Sherman had arrived, and when Bragg knew that he was on the north side of the Tennessee River, he sent Buckner's division to reinforce Longstreet. He also started another division a day later, but our attack, having commenced before it reached Knoxville, Bragg ordered it back. It had got so far, however, that it could not return to Chattanooga in time to be of service there. It is possible this latter blunder may have been made by Bragg, having become confused as to what was going on on our side. Sherman had, as already stated, crossed to the north side of the Tennessee River at Brown's Ferry, in full view of Bragg's troops from Lookout Mountain, a few days before the attack. They then disappeared behind foothills and did not come to the view of the troops on Missionary Ridge until they met their assault. Bragg knew it was Sherman's troops that had crossed, and they being so long out of view, may have supposed that they had gone up the north bank of the Tennessee River to the relief of Knoxville, and that Longstreet was therefore in danger. But the first great blunder, detaching Longstreet cannot be accounted for in any way I know of. If he had captured Chattanooga, East Tennessee would have fallen without a struggle. It would have been a victory for us to have got our army away from Chattanooga safely. It was a manifold greater victory to drive away the besieging army, a still greater one to defeat that army in his chosen ground and nearly annihilate it. The probabilities are that our loss in killed was the heavier, as we were the attacking party. The enemy reported his loss in killed at 361, but as he reported his missing at 4,146, while we held over 6,000 of them as prisoners, 
and there must have been hundreds, if not thousands, who deserted, but little reliance can be placed on this report. There was certainly great dissatisfaction with Bragg on the part of the soldiers for his harsh treatment of them, and a disposition to get away if they could. Then, too, Chattanooga, following in the same half-year with Gettysburg in the east and Vicksburg in the west, there was much the same feeling in the south at this time that there had been in the north the fall and winter before. If the same license had been allowed the people and press in the south that was allowed in the north, Chattanooga would probably have been the last battle fought for the preservation of the Union. General William F. Smith's services in these battles had been such that I thought him eminently entitled to promotion. I was aware that he had previously been named by the President for promotion to the grade of Major General, but that the Senate had rejected the nomination. I was not aware of the reasons for this course, and therefore strongly recommended him for a Major Generalcy. My recommendation was heeded, and the appointment made. Upon the raising of the siege of Knoxville, I, of course, informed the authorities at Washington, the President and Secretary of War, of the fact which caused great rejoicing there. The President especially was rejoiced that Knoxville had been relieved without further bloodshed. The safety of Burnside's army and the loyal people of East Tennessee had been the subject of much anxiety to the President for several months, during which time he was doing all he could to relieve the situation, sending a new commander, with a few thousand troops by the way of Cumberland Gap, and telegraphing me daily, almost hourly, to remember Burnside, do something for Burnside, and other appeals of like tenor. He saw no escape for East Tennessee until after our victory at Chattanooga. Even then, he was afraid that Burnside might be out of ammunition, in a starving condition, or overpowered, and his anxiety was still intense until he heard that Longstreet had been driven from the field. Burnside followed Longstreet only to Strawberry Plains, some twenty miles or more east, and then stopped, believing that Longstreet would leave the state. The latter did not do so, however, but stopped only a short distance farther on, and subsisted his army for the entire winter off East Tennessee. Foster now relieved Burnside. Sherman made disposition of his troops along the Tennessee River in accordance with instructions. I left Thomas in command at Chattanooga, and, about the 20th of December, moved my headquarters to Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville was the most central point from which to communicate with my entire military division, and also with the authorities at Washington. While remaining at Chattanooga, I was liable to have my telegraphic communications cut, so as to throw me out of communication with both my command and Washington. Nothing occurred at Nashville worthy of mention during the winter, so I set myself to the task of having troops in positions from which they could move to advantage, and in collecting all necessary supplies, so as to be ready to claim a due share of the enemy's attention upon the appearance of the first good weather in the spring. I expected to retain the command I then had, and prepared myself for the campaign against Atlanta. I also had great hopes of having a campaign made against Mobile from the Gulf. I expected, after Atlanta fell, to occupy that place permanently, and to cut off Lee's army from the west, by way of the road running through Augusta to Atlanta, and thence southwest. I was preparing to hold Atlanta with a small garrison, and it was my expectation to push through to Mobile, if that city was in our possession, if not to Savannah, and in this manner to get possession 
of the only east and west railroad that would then be left to the enemy but the spring campaign against mobile was not made the army of the ohio had been getting supplies over cumberland gap until their animals had nearly all starved i now determined to go myself to see if there was any possible chance of using that route in the spring and if not to abandon it accordingly i left nashville in the latter part of december by rail for chattanooga from chattanooga i took one of the little steamers previously spoken of as having been built there and putting my horses aboard went up to the junction of the clinch with the tennessee from that point the railroad had been repaired up to knoxville and out east to strawberry plains i went by rail therefore to knoxville where i remained for several days general john g foster was then commanding the department of the ohio it was an intensely cold winter the thermometer being down as low as zero every morning for more than a week while i was at knoxville and on my way from there on horseback to lexington kentucky the first point where i could reach rail to carry me back to my headquarters at nashville the road over cumberland gap and back of it was strewn with debris of broken wagons and dead animals much as i had found it on my first trip to chattanooga over waldron's ridge the road had been cut up to as great a depth as clay could be by mules and wagons and in that condition frozen so that the ride of six days from strawberry plains to lexington over these holes and knobs in the road was a very cheerless one and very disagreeable i found a great many people at home along that route both in tennessee and kentucky and almost universally intensely loyal they would collect in little places where we would stop of evenings to see me generally hearing of my approach before we arrived the people naturally expected to see the commanding general the oldest person in the party i was then forty-one years of age while my medical director was gray-haired and probably twelve or more years my senior the crowds would generally swarm around him and thus give me an opportunity of quietly dismounting and getting into the house it also gave me an opportunity of hearing passing remarks from one spectator to another about their general those remarks were apt to be more complimentary to the cause than to the appearance of the supposed general owing to his being muffled up and also owing to the travel-worn condition we were all in after a hard day's ride i was back in nashville by the thirteenth of january eighteen sixty four when i started on this trip it was necessary for me to have some person along who could turn dispatches into cipher and who could also read the cipher dispatches which i was liable to receive daily and almost hourly under the rules of the war department at that time mr stanton had taken entire control of the matter of regulating the telegraph and determining how it should be used and of saying who and who alone should have the ciphers the operators possessed of the ciphers as well as the ciphers used were practically independent of the commanders whom they were serving immediately under and had to report to the war department through general stager all the dispatches which they received or forwarded i was obliged to leave the telegraphic operator back at nashville because that was the point at which all dispatches to me would come to be forwarded from there as i have said it was necessary for me also to have an operator during this inspection who had possession of this cipher to enable me to telegraph to my division and to the war department without my dispatches being read by all the operators along the line of wires over which they were transmitted 
Accordingly, I ordered the cipher operator to turn over the key to Captain Cyrus B. Comstock of the Corps of Engineers, whom I had selected as a wise and discreet man who certainly could be trusted with the cipher if the operator at my headquarters could. The operator refused point blank to turn over the key to Captain Comstock as directed by me, stating that his orders from the War Department were not to give it to anybody, the commanding general or anyone else. I told him I would see whether he would or not. He said that if he did, he would be punished. I told him if he did not, he most certainly would be punished. Finally, seeing that punishment was certain, if he refused longer to obey my order, and being somewhat remote, even if he was not protected altogether from the consequences of his disobedience to his orders, from the War Department, he yielded. When I returned from Knoxville, I found quite a commotion. The operator had been reprimanded very severely and ordered to be relieved. I informed the Secretary of War, or his assistant secretary in charge of the telegraph, Steger, that the man could not be relieved, for he had only obeyed my orders. It was absolutely necessary for me to have the cipher, and the man would most certainly have been punished if he had not delivered it that they would have to punish me if they punished anybody, or words to that effect. This was about the only thing approaching a disagreeable difference between the Secretary of War and myself that occurred until the war was over when we had another little spat. Owing to his natural disposition to assume all power and control, in all matters that he had anything whatever to do with, he boldly took command of the armies, and, while issuing no orders on the subject, prohibited any order from me going out of the adjutant general's office until he had approved it. This was done by directing the adjutant general to hold any orders that came from me to be issued from the adjutant general's office until he had examined them and given his approval. He never disturbed himself either in examining my orders until it was entirely convenient for him, so that orders which I had prepared would often lie there three or four days before he would sanction them. I remonstrated against this in writing, and the secretary apologetically restored me to my rightful position of general-in-chief of the army, but he soon lapsed again and took control much as before. After the relief of Knoxville, Sherman had proposed to Burnside that he should go with him to drive Longstreet out of Tennessee, but Burnside assured him that with the troops which had been brought by Granger, and which were to be left, he would be amply prepared to dispose of Longstreet without availing himself of this offer. As before stated, Sherman's command had left their camps north of the Tennessee, near Chattanooga, with two days' rations in their haversacks, without coats or blankets, and without many wagons, expecting to return to their camps by the end of that time. The weather was now cold, and they were suffering, but still they were ready to make the further sacrifice, had it been required, for the good of the cause which had brought them into service. Sherman, having accomplished the object for which he was sent, marched back leisurely to his old camp on the Tennessee River. End of Section 45 Recording by Jim Clevenger Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger, 
Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant, Chapter 46 Operations in Mississippi Longstreet in East Tennessee Commissioned Lieutenant General Commanding the Armies of the United States First Interview with President Lincoln Soon after his return from Knoxville, I ordered Sherman to distribute his forces from Stevenson to Decatur, and thence north to Nashville. Sherman suggested that he be permitted to go back to Mississippi, to the limits of his own department, and where most of his army still remained, for the purpose of clearing out what Confederates might still be left on the east bank of the Mississippi River to impede its navigation by our boats. He expected also to have the cooperation of banks to do the same thing on the west shore. Of course, I approved heartily. About the 10th of January, Sherman was back in Memphis, where Hurlbut commanded, and got together his Memphis men, or ordered them collected and sent to Vicksburg. He then went to Vicksburg, and out to where McPherson was in command, and had him organize his surplus troops so as to give him about 20,000 men in all. Sherman knew that General Bishop Polk was occupying Meridian with his headquarters, and had two divisions of infantry with a considerable force of cavalry scattered west of him. He determined, therefore, to move directly upon Meridian. I had sent some 2,500 cavalry under General Suey Smith to Sherman's department, and they had mostly arrived before Sherman got to Memphis. Hurlbut had 7,000 cavalry, and Sherman ordered him to reinforce Smith so as to give the latter a force of about 7,000 with which to go against Forrest, who was then known to be southeast from Memphis. Smith was ordered to move about the 1st of February. While Sherman was waiting at Vicksburg for the arrival of Hurlbut with his surplus men, he sent out scouts to ascertain the position and strength of the enemy, and to bring back all the information they could gather. When these scouts returned, it was through them that he got the information of General Polk's being at Meridian, and of the strength and disposition of his command. Forrest had about 4,000 cavalry with him, composed of thoroughly well-disciplined men, who, under so able a leader, were very effective. Smith's command was nearly double that of Forrest, but not equal, man to man, for the lack of a successful experience such as Forrest's men had had. The fact is, troops who have fought a few battles and won, and followed up their victories, improve upon what they were before, to an extent that can hardly be counted by percentage. The difference in result is often decisive victory instead of inglorious defeat. This same difference, too, is often due to the way troops are officered, and for the particular kind of warfare which Forrest had carried on, neither army could present a more effective officer than he was. Sherman got off on the 3rd of February and moved out on his expedition, meeting with no opposition whatever until he crossed the Big Black, and with no great deal of opposition after that until he reached Jackson, Mississippi. This latter place he reached on the 6th or 7th, Brandon on the 8th, and Morton on the ninth. Up to this time he moved in two columns to enable him to get a good supply of forage, etc., and expedite the march. Here, however, there were indications of the concentration of Confederate infantry 
and he was obliged to keep his army close together. He had no serious engagement, but he met some of the enemy who destroyed a few of his wagons about Decatur, Mississippi, where, by the way, Sherman himself came near being picked up. He entered Meridian on the 14th of the month, the enemy having retreated toward Demopolis, Alabama. He spent several days in Meridian in thoroughly destroying the railroad to the north and south, and also for the purpose of hearing from Suey Smith, who, he supposed, had met Forrest before this time, and he hoped had gained a decisive victory because of a superiority of numbers. Hearing nothing of him, however, he started on his return trip to Vicksburg. There he learned that Smith, while waiting for a few of his men who had been ice-bound in the Ohio River, instead of getting off on the first as expected, had not left until the eleventh. Smith did meet Forrest, but the result was decidedly in Forrest's favor. Sherman had written a letter to Banks, proposing a cooperative movement with him against Shreveport, subject to my approval. I disapproved of Sherman's going himself, because I had other important work for him to do, but consented that he might send a few troops to the aid of Banks, though their time to remain absent must be limited. He must have them for the spring campaign. The Trans-Mississippi movement proved abortive. My eldest son, who had accompanied me on the Vicksburg campaign and siege, had, while there, contracted disease, which grew worse until he had grown so dangerously ill that, on the 24th of January, I obtained permission to go to St. Louis, where he was staying at the time to see him, hardly expecting to find him alive on my arrival. While I was permitted to go, I was not permitted to turn over my command to anyone else, but was directed to keep the headquarters with me, and to communicate regularly with all parts of my division, and with Washington, just as though I had remained at Nashville. When I obtained this leave, I was at Chattanooga, having gone there again to make preparations to have the troops of Thomas in the southern part of Tennessee cooperate with Sherman's movement in Mississippi. I directed Thomas and Logan, who was at Scottsboro, Alabama, to keep up a threatening movement to the south against J. E. Johnston, who had again relieved Bragg for the purpose of making him keep as many troops as possible there. I learned through Confederate sources that Johnston had already sent two divisions in the direction of Mobile, presumably to operate against Sherman, and two more divisions to Longstreet in East Tennessee. Seeing that Johnston had depleted in this way, I directed Thomas to send at least 10,000 men, besides Stanley's division, which was already to the east, into East Tennessee, and notified Schofield, who was now in command in East Tennessee, of this movement of troops into his department, and also of the reinforcements Longstreet had received. My object was to drive Longstreet out of East Tennessee as a part of the preparations for my spring campaign. About this time, General Foster, who had been in command of the Department of the Ohio after Burnside until Schofield relieved him, advised me that he thought it would be a good thing to keep Longstreet just where he was that he was perfectly quiet in East Tennessee, and if he was forced to leave there, his whole well-equipped army would be free to go to any place where it could affect the most for their cause. I thought the advice was good, and, adopting that view, 
countermanded the orders for pursuit of Longstreet. On the 12th of February, I ordered Thomas to take Dalton and hold it, if possible, and I directed him to move without delay. Finding that he had not moved on the 17th, I urged him again to start, telling him how important it was that the object of the movement was to cooperate with Sherman, who was moving eastward and might be in danger. Then again on the 21st, he not yet having started, I asked him if he could not start the next day. He finally got off on the 22nd or 23rd. The enemy fell back from his front without a battle, but took a new position quite as strong and farther to the rear. Thomas reported that he could not go any farther because it was impossible with his poor teams, nearly starved, to keep up supplies until the railroads were repaired. He soon fell back. Schofield also had to return for the same reason. He could not carry supplies with him, and Longstreet was between him and the supplies still left in the country. Longstreet, in his retreat, would be moving towards his supplies, while our forces following would be receding from theirs. On the 2nd of March, however, I learned of Sherman's success, which eased my mind very much. The next day, the 3rd, I was ordered to Washington. The bill, restoring the grade of Lieutenant General of the Army, had passed through Congress and became a law on the 26th of February. My nomination had been sent to the Senate on the 1st of March, and confirmed the next day, the second. I was ordered to Washington on the third to receive my commission, and started the day following that. The commission was handed to me on the ninth. It was delivered to me at the executive mansion by President Lincoln in the presence of his cabinet, my eldest son, those of my staff who were with me, and and a few other visitors. The President, in presenting my commission, read from a paper, stating, however, as a preliminary and prior to the delivery of it, that he had drawn that up on paper, knowing my disinclination to speak in public, and handed me a copy in advance so that I might prepare a few lines of reply. The President said, General Grant, the nation's appreciation of what you have done and its reliance upon you for what remains to be done in the existing great struggle are now presented with this commission constituting you lieutenant general in the Army of the United States with this high honor devolves upon you also a corresponding responsibility. As the country herein trusts you, so, under God, it will sustain you. I scarcely need to add that, with what I here speak for the nation, goes my own hearty personal concurrence. To this I replied, Mr. President, I accept the commission with gratitude for the high honor conferred. With the aid of the noble armies that have fought in so many fields for our common country, it will be my earnest endeavor not to disappoint your expectations. I feel the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me, and I know that if they are met, it will be due to those armies, and above all, to the favor of that providence which leads both nations and men. On the 10th, I visited the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac at Brandy Station, then returned to Washington and pushed west at once, 
to make my arrangements for turning over the commands there and giving general directions for the preparations to be made for the spring campaign it had been my intention before this to remain in the west even if i was made lieutenant general but when i got to washington and saw the situation it was plain that here was the point for the commanding general to be no one else could probably resist the pressure that would be brought to bear upon him to desist from his own plans and pursue others i determined therefore before i started back to have sherman advance to my late position mcpherson to sherman's in command of the department and logan to the command of mcpherson's corps these changes were all made on my recommendation and without hesitation my commission as lieutenant general was given to me on the ninth of march eighteen sixty four on the following day as already stated i visited general meade commanding the army of the potomac at his headquarters at brandy station north of the rapidan i had known general meade slightly in the mexican war but had not met him since until this visit i was a stranger to most of the army of the potomac i might say to all except the officers of the regular army who had served in the mexican war there had been some changes ordered in the organization of that army before my promotion one was the consolidation of five corps into three thus throwing some officers of rank out of important commands meade evidently thought that i might want to make still one more change not yet ordered he said to me that i might want an officer who had served with me in the west mentioning sherman specially to take his place if so he begged me not to hesitate about making the change he urged that the work before us was of such vast importance to the whole nation that the feeling or wishes of no one person should stand in the way of selecting the right men for all positions for himself he would serve to the best of his ability wherever placed i assured him that i had no thought of substituting any one for him as to sherman he could not be spared from the west this incident gave me even a more favorable opinion of meade than did his great victory at gettysburg the july before it is men who wait to be selected and not those who seek from whom we may always expect the most efficient service meade's position afterwards proved embarrassing to me if not to him he was commanding an army and for nearly a year previous to my taking command of all of the armies was in supreme command of the army of the potomac except from the authorities at washington all other general officers occupying similar positions were independent in their commands so far as any one present with them was concerned i tried to make general meade's position as nearly as possible what it would have been if i had been in washington or any other place away from his command i therefore gave all orders for the movements of the army of the potomac to meade to have them executed to avoid the necessity of having to give orders direct i established my headquarters near his unless there were reasons for locating them elsewhere this sometimes happened and i had on occasions to give orders direct to the troops affected on the eleventh i returned to washington and on the day after orders were published by the war department placing me in command of all the armies i had left washington the night before to return to my old command in the west and to meet sherman 
whom I had telegraphed to join me in Nashville. Sherman assumed command of the military division of the Mississippi on the 18th of March, and we left Nashville together for Cincinnati. I had Sherman accompany me that far on my way back to Washington so that we could talk over the matters about which I wanted to see him without losing any more time from my new command than was necessary. The first point which I wished to discuss was particularly about the cooperation of his command with mine when the spring campaign should commence. There were also other and minor points, minor as compared with the great importance of the question to be decided by sanguinary war, the restoration to duty of officers who had been relieved from important commands, namely McClellan, Burnside, and Fremont in the east, and Buell, McCook, Negley, and Crittenden in the west. Some time in the winter of 1863-64, I had been invited by the General-in-Chief to give my views of the campaign I thought advisable for the command under me, now Sherman's. General J. E. Johnston was defending Atlanta and the interior of Georgia with an army, the largest part of which was stationed at Dalton, about 38 miles south of Chattanooga. Dalton is at the junction of the railroad from Cleveland with the one from Chattanooga to Atlanta. There could have been no difference of opinion as to the first duty of the armies of the military division of the Mississippi. Johnston's army was the first objective, and that important railroad center Atlanta the second. At the time I wrote General Halleck, giving my views of the approaching campaign, and at the time I met General Sherman, it was expected that General Banks would be through with the campaign which he had been ordered upon before my appointment to the command of all the armies, and would be ready to cooperate with the armies east of the Mississippi, his part in the program being to move upon Mobile by land while the Navy would close the harbor and assist to the best of its ability. The plan, therefore, was for Sherman to attack Johnston and destroy his army if possible, to capture Atlanta and hold it, and with his troops and those of Banks to hold a line through to Mobile, or at least to hold Atlanta and command the railroad running east and west, and the troops from one or other of the armies to hold important points on the southern road the only east and west road that would be left in the possession of the enemy. This would cut the Confederacy in two again, as our gaining possession of the Mississippi River had done before. Banks was not ready in time for the part assigned to him, and circumstances that could not be foreseen determined the campaign which was afterwards made the success and grandeur of which has resounded throughout all lands. In regard to restoring officers who had been relieved from important commands to duty again, I left Sherman to look after those who had been removed in the West, while I looked out for the rest. I directed, however, that he should make no assignment until I could speak to the Secretary of War about the matter. I, shortly after, recommended to the Secretary the assignment of General Buell to duty. I received the assurance that duty would be offered to him, and afterwards the Secretary told me that he had offered Buell an assignment, and that the latter had declined it, saying, that it would be degradation to accept the assignment offered. I understood afterwards that he refused to serve under either Sherman or Canby because he had ranked them both. Both graduated before him, 
and ranked him in the old army. Sherman ranked him as a brigadier general. All of them ranked me in the old army, and Sherman and Buell did as brigadiers. The worst excuse a soldier can make for declining service is that he once ranked the commander he is ordered to report to. On the 23rd of March, I was back in Washington, and on the 26th took up my headquarters at Culpeper Courthouse, a few miles south of the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac. Although hailing from Illinois myself, the state of the President, I never met Mr. Lincoln until called to the Capitol to receive my commission as Lieutenant General. I knew him, however, very well, and favorably from the accounts given by officers under me at the West who had known him all their lives. I had also read the remarkable series of debates between Lincoln and Douglas a few years before, when they were rival candidates for the United States Senate. I was then a resident of Missouri, and by no means a Lincoln man in that contest, but I recognized then his great ability. In my first interview with Mr. Lincoln alone, he stated to me that he had never professed to be a military man or to know how campaigns should be conducted, and never wanted to interfere in them, but that procrastination on the part of commanders and the pressure from the people at the North and Congress, which was always with him, forced him into issuing his series of military orders, one, two, three, etc. He did not know, but they were all wrong, and did know that some of them were. All he wanted, or had ever wanted, was someone who would take the responsibility and act and call on him for all the assistance needed, pledging himself to use all the power of the government in rendering such assistance, assuring him that I would do the best I could with the means at hand, and avoid as far as possible annoying him or the War Department. Our first interview ended. The Secretary of War I had met once before only, but felt that I knew him better. While commanding in West Tennessee, we had occasionally held conversations over the wires at night when they were not being otherwise used. He and General Halleck both cautioned me against giving the President my plans of campaign, saying that he was so kind-hearted, so averse to refusing anything asked of him, that some friend would be sure to get from him all he knew. I should have said that in our interview the President told me he did not want to know what I proposed to do, but he submitted a plan of campaign of his own which he wanted me to hear and then do as I pleased about. He brought out a map of Virginia on which he had evidently marked every position occupied by the Federal and Confederate armies up to that time. He pointed out on the map two streams which empty into the Potomac, and suggested that the army might be moved on boats and landed between the mouths of these streams. We would then have the Potomac to bring our supplies and the tributaries would protect our flanks while we moved out. I listened respectfully, but did not suggest that the same streams would protect Lee's flanks while he was shutting us up. I did not communicate my plans to the President, nor did I to the Secretary of War or to General Halleck. March the 26th, my headquarters were, as stated, at Culpeper, and the work of preparing for an early campaign commenced. End of Section 46 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com
of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter forty seven the military situation plans for the campaign sheridan assigned to command of the cavalry flank movements forest at fort pillow general banks's expedition colonel mosby an incident of the wilderness campaign when i assumed command of all the armies the situation was about this the mississippi river was guarded from st louis to its mouth the line of the arkansas was held thus giving us all the northwest north of that river a few points in louisiana not remote from the river were held by the federal troops as was also the mouth of the rio grande east of the mississippi we held substantially all north of the memphis and charleston railroad as far east as chattanooga thence along the line of the tennessee and holston rivers taking in nearly all of the state of tennessee west virginia was in our hands and that part of old virginia north of the rapidan and east of the blue ridge we also held on the sea coast we had fortress monroe and norfolk in virginia plymouth washington and new Bern in north carolina beaufort folly and morris islands hilton head port royal and fort pulaski in south carolina and georgia ferdinandia st augustine key west and pensacola in florida the balance of the southern territory an empire in extent was still in the hands of the enemy sherman who had succeeded me in the command of the military division of the mississippi commanded all the troops in the territory west of the alleghanies and north of natchez with a large movable force about chattanooga his command was subdivided into four departments but the commanders all reported to sherman and were subject to his orders this arrangement however ensured the better protection of all lines of communication through the acquired territory for the reason that these different department commanders could act promptly in case of a sudden or unexpected raid within their respective jurisdictions without awaiting the orders of the division commander in the east the opposing forces stood in substantially the same relations towards each other as three years before or when the war began they were both between the federal and confederate capitals it is true footholds had been secured by us on the sea-coast in virginia and north carolina but beyond that no substantial advantage had been gained by either side battles had been fought of as great severity as had ever been known in war over ground from the james river and chickahominy near richmond to gettysburg and chambersburg in pennsylvania with indecisive results sometimes favorable to the national army sometimes to the confederate army but in every instance i believe claimed as victories for the south by the southern press if not by the southern generals the northern press as a whole did not discourage these claims a portion of it always magnified rebel success and belittled ours while another portion most sincerely earnest in their desire for the preservation of the union and the overwhelming success of the federal armies would nevertheless generally express dissatisfaction with whatever victories were gained because they were not more complete that portion of the army of the potomac not engaged in guarding lines of communication was on the northern bank of the rapidan 
The Army of Northern Virginia, confronting it on the opposite bank of the same river, was strongly entrenched and commanded by the acknowledged ablest general in the Confederate Army. The country, back to the James River, is cut up with many streams, generally narrow, deep, and difficult to cross, except where bridged. The region is heavily timbered, and the roads narrow and very bad, after the least rain. Such an enemy was not, of course, unprepared with adequate fortifications at convenient intervals all the way back to Richmond, so that when driven from one fortified position, they would always have another farther to the rear to fall back into. To provision an army campaigning against so formidable a foe through such a country, from wagons alone seemed almost impossible. System and discipline were both essential to its accomplishment. The Union armies were now divided into nineteen departments, though four of them in the West had been concentrated into a single military division. The Army of the Potomac was a separate command and had no territorial limits. There were thus seventeen distinct commanders. Before this time, these various armies had acted separately and independently of each other, giving the enemy an opportunity often of depleting one command, not pressed, to reinforce another, more actively engaged. I determined to stop this. To this end, I regarded the Army of the Potomac as the center, and all west to Memphis along the line described as our position at the time, and north of it, the right wing. The Army of the James, under General Butler, as the left wing, and all the troops south as a force in rear of the enemy. Some of these latter were occupying positions from which they could not render service proportionate to their numerical strength. All such were depleted to the minimum necessary to hold their positions as a guard against blockade runners. Where they could not do this, their positions were abandoned altogether. In this way, 10,000 men were added to the Army of the James from South Carolina alone, with General Gilmore in command. It was not contemplated that General Gilmore should leave his department, but as most of his troops were taken, presumably for active service, he asked to accompany them, and was permitted to do so. Officers and soldiers on furlough, of whom there were many thousands, were ordered to their proper commands. Concentration was the order of the day, and to have it accomplished in time to advance at the earliest moment the roads would permit was the problem. As a reinforcement to the Army of the Potomac, or to act in support of it, the Ninth Army Corps, over 20,000 strong under General Burnside, had been rendezvoused at Annapolis, Maryland. This was an admirable position for such a reinforcement. The Corps could be brought at the last moment as a reinforcement to the Army of the Potomac, or it could be thrown on the sea coast, south of Norfolk in Virginia or North Carolina, to operate against Richmond from that direction. In fact, Burnside and the War Department both thought the Ninth Corps was intended for such an expedition up to the last moment. My general plan now was to concentrate all the force possible against the Confederate armies in the field. There were but two such, as we have seen, east of the Mississippi River and facing north. The Army of Northern Virginia, General Robert E. Lee commanding, was on the south bank of the Rapidan, confronting the Army of the Potomac. The second, under General Joseph E. Johnston, was at Dalton, Georgia, opposed to Sherman, who was still at Chattanooga. Besides these main armies, the Confederates had to guard the Shenandoah Valley, a great storehouse to feed their armies from, and their line of communications from Richmond to Tennessee. Forrest, 
a brave and intrepid cavalry general, was in the west with a large force, making a larger command necessary to hold what we had gained in middle and west Tennessee. We could not abandon any territory north of the line held by the enemy because it would lay the northern states open to invasion. But as the Army of the Potomac was the principal garrison for the protection of Washington, even while it was moving on Lee, so all the forces to the west, and the Army of the James, guarded their special trusts when advancing from them, as well as when remaining at them. Better indeed, for they forced the enemy to guard his own lines and resources at a greater distance from ours, and with a greater force. Little expeditions could not so well be sent out to destroy a bridge, or tear up a few miles of railroad track, burn a storehouse, or inflict other little annoyances. Accordingly, I arranged for a simultaneous movement all along the line. Sherman was to move from Chattanooga, Johnston's army and Atlanta being his objective points. Crook, commanding in West Virginia, was to move from the mouth of the Gauley River with a cavalry force and some artillery, the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad to be his objective. Either the enemy would have to keep a large force to protect their communications, or see them destroyed and a large amount of forage and provision, which they so much needed, fall into our hands. Siegel was in command in the Valley of Virginia. He was to advance up the valley, covering the north from an invasion through that channel as well, while advancing as by remaining near Harper's Ferry. Every mile he advanced also gave us possession of stores on which Lee relied. Butler was to advance by the James River, having Richmond and Petersburg as his objective. Before the advance commenced, I visited Butler at Fort Monroe. This was the first time I'd ever met him before giving him any order as to the part he was to play in the approaching campaign i invited his views they were very much such as i intended to direct and as i did direct in writing before leaving general w f smith who had been promoted to the rank of major general shortly after the battle of chattanooga on my recommendation had not yet been confirmed. I found a decided prejudice against his confirmation by a majority of the Senate, but I insisted that his services had been such that he should be rewarded. My wishes were now reluctantly complied with, and I assigned him to the command of one of the corps under General Butler. I was not long in finding out that the objections to Smith's promotion were well founded in one of my early interviews with the president i expressed my dissatisfaction with the little that had been accomplished by the cavalry so far in the war and the belief that it was capable of accomplishing much more than it had done if under a thorough leader i said i wanted the very best man in the army for that command halleck was present and spoke up saying how would sheridan do i replied the very man i want the president said i could have anybody i wanted sheridan was telegraphed for that day and on his arrival was assigned to the command of the cavalry corps with the army of the potomac this relieved general alfred pleasanton it was not a reflection on that officer however for I did not know but that he had been as efficient as any other cavalry commander. Banks, in the Department of the Gulf, was ordered to assemble all the troops he had at New Orleans in time to join in the general move, Mobile to be his objective. At this time I was not entirely decided as to whether I should move the Army of the Potomac by the right flank of the enemy, or 
by his left. Each plan presented advantages. If by his right, my left, the Potomac, Chesapeake Bay, and tributaries would furnish us an easy hauling distance of every position the army could occupy from the Rapidan to the James River, but Lee could, if he chose, detach or move his whole army north on a line rather interior to the one I would have to take in following. A movement by his left, our right, would obviate this, but all that was done would have to be done with the supplies and ammunition we started with. All idea of adopting this latter plan was abandoned when the limited quantity of supplies possible to take with us was considered. The country over which we would have to pass was so exhausted of all food or forage that we would be obliged to carry everything with us. While these preparations were going on, the enemy was not entirely idle. In the west, Forrest made a raid in West Tennessee, up to the northern border, capturing the garrison of four or five hundred men at Union City, and followed it up by an attack on Paducah, Kentucky, on the banks of the Ohio. While he was able to enter the city, he failed to capture the forts or any part of the garrison. On the first intelligence of Forrest's raid, I telegraphed Sherman to send all his cavalry against him and not to let him get out of the trap he had put himself into. Sherman had anticipated me by sending troops against him before he got my order. Forrest, however, fell back rapidly and attacked the troops at Fort Pillow, a station for the protection of the navigation of the Mississippi River. The garrison consisted of a regiment of colored troops, infantry, and a detachment of Tennessee cavalry. These troops fought bravely, but were overpowered. I will leave Forrest in his dispatches to tell what he did with them. The river was dyed, he said, with the blood of the slaughtered for two hundred yards. The approximate loss was upward of five hundred killed, but few of the officers escaping. My loss was about twenty killed. It is hoped that these facts will demonstrate to the northern people that Negro soldiers cannot cope with Southerners. Subsequently, Forrest made a report in which he left out the part which shocks humanity to read. At the east, also, the rebels were busy. I had said to Halleck that Plymouth and Washington, North Carolina, were unnecessary to hold. It would be better to have the garrisons engaged there added to Butler's command. If success attended our arms, both places, and others too, would fall into our hands naturally. These places had been occupied by Federal troops before I took command of the armies, and I knew that the executive would be reluctant to abandon them, and therefore explained my views. But before my views were carried out, the rebels captured the garrison at Plymouth, I then ordered the abandonment of Washington, but directed the holding of New Bern at all hazards. This was essential, because New Bern was a port into which blockade runners could enter. General Banks had gone on an expedition up the Red River long before my promotion to general command. I had opposed the movement strenuously but acquiesced because it was the order of my superior at the time. By direction of Halleck, I had reinforced Banks with a corps of about 10,000 men from Sherman's command. This reinforcement was wanted back badly before the forward movement commenced. But Banks had got so far that it seemed best that he should take Shreveport on the Red River, and turn over the line of that river to Steele, who commanded in Arkansas, to hold instead of the line of the Arkansas. Orders were given accordingly, 
and with the expectation that the campaign would be ended in time for banks to return a j smith's command to where it belonged and get back to new orleans himself in time to execute his part of the general plan but the expedition was a failure banks did not get back in time to take part in the program as laid down nor was smith returned until long after the movements of may eighteen sixty four had been begun the services of forty thousand veteran troops over and above the number required to hold all that was necessary in the department of the gulf were thus paralyzed it is but just to banks however to say that his expedition was ordered from washington and he was in no way responsible except for the conduct of it i make no criticism on this point he opposed the expedition by the twenty seventh of april spring had so far advanced as to justify me in fixing a day for the great move on that day burnside left annapolis to occupy meade's position between bull run and the rappahannock meade was notified and directed to bring his troops forward to his advance on the following day butler was notified of my intended advance on the fourth of may and he was directed to move the night of the same day and get as far up the james river as possible by daylight and push on from there to accomplish the task given him he was also notified that reinforcements were being collected in washington city which would be forwarded to him should the enemy fall back into the trenches at richmond the same day sherman was directed to get his forces up ready to advance on the fifth siegel was in winchester and was notified to move in conjunction with the others the criticism has been made by writers on the campaign from the rapidan to the james river that all the loss of life could have been obviated by moving the army there on transports richmond was fortified and entrenched so perfectly that one man inside to defend was more than equal to five outside besieging or assaulting to get possession of lee's army was the first great object with the capture of his army richmond would necessarily follow it was better to fight him outside of his stronghold than in it if the army of the potomac had been moved bodily to the james river by water lee could have moved a part of his forces back to richmond called beauregard from the south to reinforce it and with the balance moved on to washington then too i ordered a move simultaneous with that of the army of the potomac up the james river by a formidable army already collected at the mouth of the river while my headquarters were at culpeper from the twenty sixth of march to the fourth of may i generally visited washington once a week to confer with the secretary of war and the president on the last occasion a few days before moving a circumstance occurred which came near postponing my part in the campaign altogether colonel john s mosby had for a long time been commanding a partisan corps or regiment which operated in the rear of the army of the potomac on my return to the field on this occasion as the train approached warrenton junction a heavy cloud of dust was seen to the east of the road as if made by a body of cavalry on a charge arriving at the junction the train was stopped and inquiries made as to the cause of the dust there was but one man at the station and he informed us that mosby had crossed a few minutes before at full speed in pursuit of federal cavalry had he seen our train coming no doubt he would have let his prisoners escape to capture the train i was on a special train if i remember correctly without any guard since the close of the war i have come to know colonel mosby personally and somewhat intimately 
he is a different man entirely from what i had supposed he is slender not tall wiry and looks as if he could endure any amount of physical exercise he is able and thoroughly honest and truthful there were probably but few men in the south who could have commanded successfully a separate detachment in the rear of an opposing army and so near the border of hostilities as long as he did without losing his entire command on this same visit to washington i had my last interview with the president before reaching the james river he had of course become acquainted with the fact that a general movement had been ordered all along the line and seemed to think it a new feature in war i explained to him that it was necessary to have a great number of troops to guard and hold the territory we had captured and to prevent incursions into the northern states these troops could perform this service just as well by advancing as by remaining still and by advancing they would compel the enemy to keep detachments to hold them back or else lay his own territory open to invasion his answer was oh yes i see that as we say out west if a man can't skin he must hold a leg while somebody else does there was a certain incident connected with the wilderness campaign of which it may not be out of place to speak and to avoid a digression further on i will mention it here a few days before my departure from culpeper the hon e b washburn visited me there and remained with my headquarters for some distance south through the battle of the wilderness and i think to spotsylvania he was accompanied by a mr swinton whom he presented as a literary gentleman who wished to accompany the army with a view of writing a history of the war when it was over he assured me and i have no doubt swinton gave him the assurance that he was not present as a correspondent of the press i expressed an entire willingness to have him swinton accompany the army and would have allowed him to do so as a correspondent restricted however in the character of the information he could give we received richmond papers with about as much regularity as if there had been no war and knew that our papers were received with equal regularity by the confederates it was desirable therefore that correspondents should not be privileged spies of the enemy within our lines probably mr swinton expected to be an invited guest at my headquarters and was disappointed that he was not asked to become so at all events he was not invited and soon i found that he was corresponding with some paper i have now forgotten which one thus violating his word either expressed or implied he knew of the assurance washburn had given as to the character of his mission i never saw the man from the day of our introduction to the present that i recollect he accompanied us however for a time at least the second night after crossing the rapidan the night of the fifth of may colonel w r rowley of my staff was acting as night officer at my headquarters a short time before midnight i gave him verbal instructions for the night three days later i read in a richmond paper a verbatim report of these instructions a few nights still later after the first and possibly after the second day's fighting in the wilderness general meade came to my tent for consultation bringing with him some of his staff officers both his staff and mine retired to the campfire some yards in front of the tent thinking our conversation should be private there was a stump a little to one side and between the front of the tent and the campfire one of my staff colonel t s bowers saw what he took to be a man seated on the ground and leaning against the stump listening to the conversation between meade and myself he called the attention of colonel raleigh to it 
The latter immediately took the man by the shoulder and asked him, in language more forcible than polite, what he was doing there. The man proved to be Swinton, the historian, and his replies to the question were evasive and unsatisfactory, and he was warned against further eavesdropping. The next I heard of Mr. Swinton was at Cold Harbor. General Meade came to my headquarters saying that General Burnside had arrested Swinton, who at some previous time had given great offense, and had ordered him to be shot that afternoon. I promptly ordered the prisoner to be released, but that he must be expelled from the lines of the army not to return again on pain of punishment. End of section 47 Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 48. Commencement of the Grand Campaign. General Butler's Position. Sheridan's First Raid. The armies were now all ready to move for the accomplishment of a single object. They were acting as a unit so far as such a thing was possible over such a vast field. Lee, with the capital of the Confederacy, was the main end to which all were working. Johnston, with Atlanta, was an important obstacle in the way of our accomplishing the result aimed at and was, therefore, almost an independent objective. It was of less importance only because the capture of Johnston and his army would not produce so immediate and decisive a result in closing the rebellion as would the possession of Richmond, Lee, and his army. All other troops were employed exclusively in support of these two movements. This was the plan, and I will now endeavor to give, as concisely as I can, the method of its execution, outlining first the operations of minor detached but cooperative columns. As stated before, Banks failed to accomplish what he had been sent to do on the Red River, and eliminated the use of 40,000 veterans whose cooperation in the grand campaign had been expected, 10,000 with Sherman and 30,000 against Mobile. Siegel's record is almost equally brief. He moved out, it is true, according to program, but just when I was hoping to hear of good work being done in the valley, I received instead the following announcement from Halleck. Siegel is in full retreat on Strasburg. He will do nothing but run. Never did anything else. The enemy had intercepted him about Newmarket, and handled him roughly, leaving him short six guns and some nine hundred men out of his six thousand. The plan had been for an advance of Siegel's forces in two columns, though the one under his immediate command failed ingloriously. The other proved more fortunate. Under Crook and Averell, his western column advanced from the Gauley in West Virginia at the appointed time, and with more happy results. They reached the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad at Dublin, and destroyed a depot of supplies, besides tearing up several miles of road and burning the bridge over New River, Having accomplished this, they recrossed the Alleghenies to Meadow Bluffs, and there awaited further orders. Butler embarked at Fort Monroe, 
with all his command except the cavalry and some artillery which moved up the south bank of the james river his steamers moved first up chesapeake bay and york river as if threatening the rear of lee's army at midnight they turned back and butler by daylight was far up the james river he seized city point and bermuda hundred early in the day without loss and no doubt very much to the surprise of the enemy this was the accomplishment of the first step contemplated in my instructions to butler he was to act from here looking to richmond as his objective point i had given him to understand that i should aim to fight lee between the rapidan and richmond if he would stand but should lee fall back into richmond i would follow up and make a junction of the armies of the potomac and the james on the james river he was directed to secure a footing as far up the south side of the river as he could at as early a date as possible butler was in position by the sixth of may and had begun entrenching and on the seventh he sent out his cavalry from suffolk to cut the weldon railroad he also sent out detachments to destroy the railroad between petersburg and richmond but no great success attended these latter efforts he made no great effort to establish himself on that road and neglected to attack petersburg which was almost defenseless about the eleventh he advanced slowly until he reached the works at drury's bluff about half way between bermuda hundred and richmond in the meantime beauregard had been gathering reinforcements on the sixteenth he attacked butler with great vigor and with such success as to limit very materially the further usefulness of the army of the james as a distinct factor in the campaign i afterward ordered a portion of it to join the army of the potomac leaving a sufficient force with butler to man his works hold securely the footing he had already gained and maintain a threatening front toward the rear of the confederate capital the position which general butler had chosen between the two rivers the james and appomattox was one of great natural strength one where a large area of ground might be thoroughly enclosed by means of a single entrenched line and that a very short one in comparison with the extent of territory which it thoroughly protected his right was protected by the james river his left by the appomattox and his rear by their junction the two streams uniting nearby the bends of the two streams shortened the line that had been chosen for entrenchments while it increased the area which the line enclosed previous to ordering any troops from butler i sent my chief engineer general barnard from the army of the potomac to that of the james to inspect butler's position and ascertain whether i could again safely make an order for general butler's movement in cooperation with mine now that i was getting so near richmond or if i could not whether his position was strong enough to justify me in withdrawing some of his troops and having them brought round by water to white house to join me and reinforce the army of the potomac general barnard reported the position very strong for defensive purposes and that i could do the latter with great security but that general butler could not move from where he was in cooperation to produce any effect he said that the general occupied a place between the james and appomattox rivers which was of great strength and where with an inferior force he could hold it for an indefinite length of time against a superior but that he could do nothing offensively i then asked him why butler could not move out from his lines and push across the richmond and pittsburgh railroad to the rear and on the south side of richmond he replied that it was impracticable because the enemy 
had substantially the same line across the neck of land that general butler had he then took out his pencil and drew a sketch of the locality remarking that the position was like a bottle and that butler's line of entrenchments across the neck represented the cork that the enemy had built an equally strong line immediately in front of him across the neck and it was therefore as if butler was in a bottle he was perfectly safe against an attack but as barnard expressed it the enemy had corked the bottle and with a small force could hold the cork in its place this struck me as being very expressive of his position particularly when i saw the hasty sketch which general barnard had drawn and in making my subsequent report i used that expression without adding quotation marks never thinking that anything had been said that would attract attention as this did very much to the annoyance no doubt of general butler and i know very much to my own i found afterwards that this was mentioned in the notes of general Bado's book which when they were shown to me i asked to have stricken out yet it was retained there though against my wishes i make this statement here because although i have often made it before it has never been in my power until now to place it where it will correct history and i desire to rectify all injustice that i may have done to individuals particularly to officers who were gallantly serving their country during the trying period of the war for the preservation of the union general butler certainly gave his very earnest support to the war and he gave his own best efforts personally to the suppression of the rebellion the further operations of the army of the james can best be treated of in connection with those of the army of the potomac the two being so intimately associated and connected as to be substantially one body in which the individuality of the supporting wing is merged before giving the reader a summary of sherman's great atlanta campaign which must conclude my description of the various cooperative movements preparatory to proceeding with that of the operations of the center i will briefly mention sheridan's first raid upon lee's communications which though an incident of the operations on the main line and not specifically marked out in the original plan attained in its brilliant execution and results all the proportions of an independent campaign by thus anticipating in point of time i will be able to more perfectly observe the continuity of events occurring in my immediate front when i shall have undertaken to describe our advance from the rapidan on the eighth of may just after the battle of the wilderness and when we were moving on spotsylvania i directed sheridan verbally to cut loose from the army of the potomac pass around the left of lee's army and attack his cavalry to cut the two roads one running west through gordonsville charlottesville and lynchburg the other to richmond and when compelled to do so for want of forage and rations to move on to the james river and draw these from butler's supplies this move took him past the entire rear of lee's army these orders were also given in writing through meade the object of this move was threefold first if successfully executed and it was he would annoy the enemy by cutting his line of supplies and telegraphic communications and destroy or get for his own use supplies in store in the rear and coming up second he would draw the enemy's cavalry after him and thus better protect our flanks rear and trains than by remaining with the army third his absence would save the trains drawing his forage and other supplies from fredericksburg which had now become our base he started at daylight the next morning 
and accomplished more than was expected. It was sixteen days before he got back to the Army of the Potomac. The course Sheridan took was directly to Richmond. Before night, Stuart, commanding the Confederate cavalry, came on to the rear of his command, but the advance kept on, crossed the North Anna, and at Beaver Dam, a station on the Virginia Central Railroad, recaptured 400 Union prisoners on their way to Richmond, destroyed the road, and used and destroyed a large amount of subsistence and medical stores. Stuart, seeing that our cavalry was pushing towards Richmond, abandoned the pursuit on the morning of the 10th and, by a detour and an exhausting march, interposed between Sheridan and Richmond at Yellow Tavern, only about six miles north of the city. Sheridan destroyed the railroad and more supplies at Ashland, and on the 11th arrived in Stuart's front. A severe engagement ensued, in which the losses were heavy on both sides, but the rebels were beaten, their leader mortally wounded, and some guns and many prisoners were captured. Sheridan passed through the outer defenses of Richmond, and could, no doubt, have passed through the inner ones. But having no supports near, he could not have remained. After caring for his wounded, he struck for the James River below the city to communicate with Butler and to rest his men and horses as well as to get food and forage for them. He moved first between the Chickahominy and the James, but in the morning, the 12th, he was stopped by batteries at Mechanicsville. He then turned to cross to the north side of the Chickahominy by Meadow Bridge. He found this barred and the defeated Confederate cavalry, reorganized, occupying the opposite side. The panic created by his first entrance within the outer works of Richmond having subsided, troops were sent out to attack his rear. He was now in a perilous position, one from which but few generals could have extricated themselves. The defenses of Richmond, manned, were to the right, the Chickahominy was to the left, with no bridge remaining, and the opposite bank guarded, to the rear was a force from Richmond. This force was attacked and beaten by Wilson's and Gregg's divisions, while Sheridan turned to the left with the remaining division and hastily built a bridge over the Chickahominy under the fire of the enemy forced a crossing, and soon dispersed the Confederates he found there. The enemy was held back from the stream by the fire of the troops not engaged in bridge-building. On the 13th, Sheridan was at Bottoms Bridge, over the Chickahominy. On the 14th, he crossed this stream, and on that day went into camp on the James River at Hawksall's Landing. He at once put himself into communication with General Butler, who directed all the supplies he wanted to be furnished. Sheridan had left the Army of the Potomac at Spotsylvania, but did not know where either this or Lee's army was now. Great caution, therefore, had to be exercised in getting back. On the 17th, after resting his command for three days, he started on his return. He moved by the way of White House. The bridge over the Pamunkey had been burned by the enemy, but a new one was speedily improvised, and the cavalry crossed over it. On the 22nd, he was at Aylets on the Metapony, where he learned the position of the two armies. On the 24th, he joined us on the march from North Anna to Cold Harbor, in the vicinity of Chesterfield. Sheridan, in this memorable raid, passed entirely around Lee's army, encountered his cavalry in four engagements, and defeated them in all, recaptured 400 Union prisoners, and killed and captured many of the enemy. 
destroyed and used many supplies and munitions of war, destroyed miles of railroad and telegraph, and freed us from annoyance by the cavalry of the enemy for more than two weeks. End of section 48. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com.